Welcome, fellow seekers of Adam, to this sermon which is the first in a series on the unarmed weapons of Fallout. Possibly the most underused of all classes of weapons, there are some true gems in the Fallout series, as well as some seriously problematic weapons that shouldn't work at all the way that they are shown in game. Hopefully going through these weapons will inspire a future unarmed playthrough, because you can make some really fun role plays with an unarmed build. As a reminder to those that are new to the channel, I have a comment highlight at the end where I show and respond to a selection of comments from all of you, and I also have a Discord if you want to interact with me more directly. Lastly, I am starting a new practice of showcasing Fallout community creators and their projects because you guys are some of the most passionate and creative people I know. Stay tuned at the end to get all this good stuff. Now, Turn up the rads and listen to Rad Dad while we go over some of the unarmed weapons of the Fallout franchise. The first unarmed weapon we will look at is a weapon, if you want to call it that, that was meant to make punches less damaging and lethal. So basically the opposite of a weapon. The boxing gloves are often first encountered by the chosen one in Fallout 2 when they go to the boxing ring in New Reno, where the player will be automatically equipped with them if they decide to fight in the ring. The gloves do an abysmal one damage, which, again, boxing gloves aren't meant to be weapons in the first place, so that actually makes sense. With a range of one, the only decent thing about these gloves is the 3 AP cost, and I guess the fact that you can get them for free, but we are really scraping the bottom of the barrel here. The other fighters that can be seen at the ring are actually given a version called the Special Boxer Weapon that gives them extra attack animations such as headbutting and hook punches. But unfortunately, the hook punch animations go unused because these gloves have a range of zero. The unique version called the plated boxing gloves have a different in-game look, but only because the gloves are arranged differently, they don't actually look any different. These gloves, however, have a metal plate sewn into the glove to make them deal more damage, which is usually between 2 and 5, making them still not great for combat, but they can really help the chosen one if the player decides to fight in the boxing ring. If the Chosen One has them equipped when they enter the ring, they will be able to fight with the plated gloves instead of the normal gloves, which can make the bouts go much more favorably due to the increased damage output. They can be found in a locker downstairs of the Shark Club, but are otherwise identical to the boxing gloves. Fallout New Vegas is the next time we see boxing gloves with an older look as they aren't as vibrant red as in Fallout 2. Similar to Fallout 2, the damage is pitiful, but the AP costs and strength requirements are so low that they can be used to max effect by essentially any player. What makes the boxing gloves in Fallout New Vegas so interesting though is the added mechanic of fatigue, which is a hidden stat that operates much like HP. When a character's fatigue is depleted completely, rather than dying, they will become unconscious for a time. The gloves will deal 35 fatigue damage on each strike, which, coupled with the attack speed, can whittle down opponents fairly quickly depending on the player's stats and the enemy's endurance level. There are some enemy types that are immune to fatigue damage however, like robots, and the glove will actually do 10 hit points worth of damage to robotic enemies to make up for the fact that they would otherwise not do any damage at all because of the lack of fatigue. Available at a number of places including Good Springs, Prim, and of course New Vegas itself, the VAT's special attacks include an uppercut, a cross, and stomp, which almost makes it necessary to have your unarmed player also be a VAT's build just to keep things interesting. A variant of the boxing gloves are the vaunted golden gloves, which do more fatigue damage than the vanilla boxing gloves and the most damage to creatures not affected by fatigue. The golden gloves not only do more damage, but have a lot more pizzazz and look much newer with a nice golden color. All other stats are the same and the golden gloves can be found in the Lucky 38 in the VIP lounge where it is found with a copy of Boxing Times close by. Obviously, the inspiration here is the National Golden Gloves competition that is held annually in the US, but it is a great excuse to have a flashy weapon in the otherwise sun-bleached and dreary Mojave. The Golden Gloves have a few oddities where the robots Festus and Muggy can both be disabled with the Golden Gloves, whereas no other robots can, and indeed no robots really should be able to at all. Not only that, but turrets will also act strangely, where they will be destroyed without exploding, or maybe they are merely disabled, and they can be looted afterwards. 
boxing tape is another New Vegas weapon that is considered a variant of the boxing gloves, because even though they differ drastically in appearance, they have largely the same effect. Being simply the character's hands covered in tape, boxing tape will do overall less fatigue damage than gloves, as well as reduce normal damage when fighting fatigue-resistant enemies. Costing the same AP and having the same attack speed, boxing tape doesn't really do anything that the boxing gloves don't do, with the only advantage being that it has the best durability of all the boxing glove type weapons, which can strike over 2,000 times before they break. A cut variant of the boxing tape would have been the so-called Starlet's Hand Wraps, which look identical to the boxing tape, except they knock down enemies more often and will emit an electrical glow that is similar to the other electrical weapons of the game. We don't know any other details about why they are so effective or what makes them glow this blue color, but maybe there were some high-stake boxing matches going on between celebrities back in the day. Fallout 4 gives us the boxing glove again. This time there is no fatigue mechanic to speak of, so it just does normal damage. It has a few upgrades that will help eke out a bit more power for your Mike Tyson roleplay. Spiked and puncturing adds sharp metal to the glove that allow it to be armor piercing, while also increasing damage by up to 10 for the superior puncturing mod. Lead lining is presumably similar to Fallout 2's plated gloves, where lead is added to the glove to make them heavier and harder, which does the most damage of all the modification options, even having extra limb damage and higher cripple chances. Fallout 76 features the glove in the same form, with only the spiked and puncturing mods, but it is otherwise the same, being a low damage weapon with a medium swing speed, which means that it is only effective in the very early game, or for someone role-playing as a boxer. Pro tip, if you are doing a boxer roleplay, make sure to get the cannibal perk, so you can reenact Mike Tyson biting off Evander Holyfield's ear. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel has the so-called burning gloves, which looks like a power fist that has had a canister of flammable substance attached to the top. It is not a flamethrower. Instead, the intended effect is to have napalm be stuck or smeared or splashed onto a target when making contact with the burning glove through ideally a punch, but maybe even a slap, after which a flame will ignite the napalm and set the target alight. It can be found in the first chapter of the game and is not a great option later in the game because the damage is not that great, maxing out at 34, and the non-ranged ability of the weapon means that melee and unarmed weapons need to really make it worth it by outputting tons of damage, which this one just doesn't do. The Power Fist is undoubtedly one of the most recognizable unarmed weapons in the Fallout series and has been included in some form in every single game to date. That's a lot of Power Fist. The Power Fist itself looks very similar to medieval gauntlets, and if I just saw the in-game model, I wouldn't assume that it is anything more than that. It is, however, a lot more than just a metal armored glove, because it is powered by small energy cells and made to impart massive damage when hitting a target. How this damage is imparted isn't made clear in the game as the description and animations don't give us any clues, but it is possible that the kinetic energy storage that the Super Sledge uses may also be used with the Power Fist. The biggest problem is that looking at the weapon, there is no obvious mechanism for imparting more kinetic energy like maybe a part that flies forward and impacts a target, upon a successful strike. The knuckles look to have large studs that no doubt cause most of the damage, and this weapon is the most damaging of all the unarmed options. Due to this, it is not encountered until areas that are usually explored when higher level, like the Mariposa military base and the Boneyard. It benefits from the weapon penetration perk, which helps bypass a target's damage threshold, costs only 3 AP, but does not benefit from any other effect and of course, the range is severely limited. In Fallout 2, the Power Fist shows up in the same form with no changes from the first game. Fallout 2 does up the ante though by introducing the Mega Power Fist. Looking even more hardcore than the base Power Fist, and something that a Nazgul would wear, it has even more spikes and now glows green, so I hope you weren't planning on sneaking up on anyone. Doing up to 40 damage, it costs 2 energy cells per hit instead of 1 in order to achieve this extra damage, but it is definitely worth it. It can be bought at New Reno or San Francisco, both being late game areas due to its high damage output. Fallout Tactics has the Power Fist, although it seems to have just skipped the original game's base Power Fist altogether, and instead use an image similar to the Mega Power Fist. 
It is still looking very medieval-like with the very prominent spiked knuckles, and the green glow gives it a cool overall look. It is a heavy hitting weapon, being the most damaging of all the unarmed options and tactics, and is still using small energy cells. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel draws a distinction, like Fallout 2, between the base power fist and the mega power fist. The power fist looks drastically different and is battery powered this time so no energy cells are needed, and when it hits a target, it deals some sort of explosive electrical damage and glows a deep electric blue. Doing up to 65 damage, this is a good weapon for the first and second chapters of the game, but quickly loses out to its big brother, the Mega Power Fist. The Mega Power Fist has the same electrical attack and requires no outside energy source, similar to the Power Fist, but can do a whopping 200 points of damage in one hit. It also has the ability to knock enemies back, which is very useful in situations where you are getting thronged by enemies. It looks different from the Power Fist, and rather than having a medieval armored look like previous games, both look very futuristic and like something from a game set in space. Fallout 3 reinvents the Power Fist once again, giving it a very industrial look. It is also now very obvious exactly how the Power Fist clobbers potential foes, since there is a large metal ram that is actuated by a large piston. The actual glove part is under the ram, which allows the player to still have some use of their hand, even though they have this extremely heavy ram mechanism on top. The ram shoots forward when the player reaches the apex of their punch, and how this is activated is not clear, although there could be some sort of pressure switch that actuates the system when the user's fist is clenched enough. There seems to be exhaust ports on the rear of the power fist, hinting toward a very hot operational system that needs dedicated cooling. The Power Fist still does not require any sort of ammunition or energy. It is somehow stored inside in some fashion, although Fallout 3 does have a number of weapons that have mystery energy or ammunition sources, like what fuel keeps the shish kebab alight, or where the Gauss Rifle gets its projectiles from. The Power Fist does a good amount of damage and is only trailing behind some unique variants that increase the overall damage. One such variant is Fisto which looks just like the vanilla power fist, but does more damage and has a slightly higher critical multiplier. It is found in a power plant across from the MDPL-13 power station, although there are no hints as to why it is found there, nor is it explained what it is about this weapon that makes it so much better than the base power fist. But due to the increase in damage, it is a necessary pickup for anyone doing an unarmed build. It is rather interesting that not long after Fallout 3's release, in IGN's coverage of the game, they referred specifically to this weapon, but described it as shards of metal attached to the character's hand. That is obviously not the case, and I can't help but wonder if there was an alternate form of this weapon at some point, or it had been described to IGN differently than how it was implemented in-game for whatever reason. The Shocker is the other unique variant of the Power Fist and continues the practice of giving Power Fist variants very questionable names. It does the same amount of damage as the base Power Fist, but will do an extra 25% damage against robots, which can be useful in areas with a lot of defensive bots. What is most interesting is that it is found with a holotape that describes the device as not a weapon or something that is not meant to be used around children, domestic animals, or uncooked food. This was a prototype that had a number of known faults according to the holotape, but in-game it does not exhibit any issues. If it wasn't meant as a weapon, who knows what the actual purpose was. I suppose it could have some industrial application, but with the extra damage against robots, I can't help but think that it has some connection to working with technology or electricity. Perhaps it was meant to be used to assist in interacting with or fixing electrical components. It can be found in the flooded metro and guarded by a rigged up shotgun, possibly indicating that whoever left it meant to come back and retrieve the weapon. There's also a sim version that is used in the Operation Anchorage simulation that does not deteriorate with use like other versions. The Power Fist has 33 tally marks on it, likely indicating the number of kills by whoever had the Power Fist before. And it is interesting to note that in VATS, if the enemy is below waist level, then the player will kick the enemy rather than punch, which is normal for all unarmed weapons. However, the Power Fist striking sound will still be heard, which is pretty funny. Do you want to know who else's kicks sound like a mechanical device? A synth. Lone Wanderer is a synth confirmed. Fallout New Vegas does what it does best, 
It takes something from Fallout 3 and runs with it. The Power Fist, like most weapons in Fallout 3 and in Fallout New Vegas, has a damage increase to make it work with how the developers balance damage in New Vegas. It does double the damage and has the same attack speed as Fallout 3, but that attack speed was higher before the Old World Blues add-on, where they reduced it when they introduced several new variants. The Gunrunner's Arsenal brought a few of its own versions, the first of which is identical in every way, except it accepts mods. Power Fist Chrome Tubes increases durability by 100% pushing it from 395 strikes to breaking to 795, which isn't exactly 100%, but eh, good enough. Power Fist High Capacity Valves increases damage by 8, and the Ported Chambers increases attack speed by 20%. All of these upgrades are well worth it, since the Power Fist is a holdout weapon, and that really benefits unarmed builds. The other Gun Runners variant is known as Greased Lightning, and is my favorite looking of all New Vegas variants. The Power Fist is kind of special in this regard since most often the Gun Runner's Arsenal only introduces one variant of a weapon, but the Power Fist has two. Greased Lightning, being dark black, has a large nuclear symbol on the top because it is apparently nuclear powered, and this power source allows the weapon to strike much faster than the other variants, striking three times a second. It does not accept the mods that you can put on the base gun runner's power fist, but it does have a similar durability as the modded power fist. But this is simply needed because the increased strike speed means it degrades a lot quicker. An interesting note is that it can be bought from Torres at the Lost Hills Brotherhood bunker, or bought from the gun runner's Vendertron. So if the Brotherhood is angered or destroyed, your only option will be the gun runners. The name is a reference to a popular 50s and 60s idiom where one would say something was faster than Greased Lightning, and many people, like myself, are probably only aware of that due to the movie Grease. Salt Upon Wounds Power Fist is an Honest Hearts unique variant that is used by, you guessed it, your mother. Painted white with orange markings and some large feathers, the most interesting component is the addition of a bunch of salt affixed to the ram by some sort of adhesive. Ideally, this setup would drive salt into whatever open wounds were created by the Power Fist, which has the effect of doing an extra 3 damage for 10 seconds and making the target dizzy upon a critical strike. I have to wonder if he was always named Salt Upon Wounds, or if he got that name from the use of this specially modified Power Fist. The player can loot this unique variant from Salt Upon Wounds' corpse after defeating him, or a locker near the entrance or exit to Zion Canyon at the end of the DLC located in a footlocker. If the player loots the Power Fist from Salt Upon Wounds and then drops it somewhere where it can be recovered, they can get the Power Fist from the Foot Locker at the entrance and then go and retrieve the other dropped Power Fist for a total of two. Old World Blues gives us this amazing new material, Saturnite, and then had nothing better to do with it than to make a Power Fist out of it. Due to being a much lighter material, it has a higher attack speed, although at the cost of raw damage. It has lower DPS than Greased Lightning and is one of the weaker of the variants available. The Toaster from the Sink will take a Saturnite Power Fist and apply a process only which he is privy to in order to create the Superheated Power Fist, which is a base Saturnite Fist that is heated to the point that it glows, dealing fire damage to enemies. The superheating process persists no matter what and has damaged the Fist mechanism since it attacks a bit slower than the base Saturnite Fist but still faster than the standard Power Fist. Since it does extra damage and still strikes quicker than the base Power Fist, it makes a very formidable weapon and is the second strongest of all the variants. I just want to think about this weapon for a second though, since having a superheated weapon is problematic on so many levels. Maybe the Fist's power source is somehow heating the Fist, although you would think that the user would have their hand cooked if they had to wear this thing, unless the glove itself is made out of some very high-tech insulator. Even if that wasn't a concern, putting the glove on and storing it in the player's pack or wherever they store their inventory would obviously be very problematic. And honestly, it would seem to make more sense if just the ram part of the power fist was heated, since that is really the only part that is impacting the enemy. But I guess we should all expect such a hardcore weapon from everyone's favorite genocidal toaster. Lonesome Road gets its own version of the power fist, known as the Industrial Fist. This was a pre-war tool that helped workers cut a variety of materials and was obviously repurposed after the Great War. It works slightly differently though, with a large circular blade that spins when activated, 
and when pulling the trigger, the ram will remain forward, rather than punching forward and retracting like every other power fist. This way it can do continual damage, and as a result can strike almost 8,000 times before breaking. The damage is high at 50, and the DPS is the highest of all variants, due to the continual damage at 160. This weapon does not stop there however since it ignores both damage resistance and damage threshold as it cuts through armor. It can be found in a few places in the divide, but is marked as player only so NPCs cannot use it. It also has a very high critical chance for a continual damage weapon, unlike the chainsaw or thermic lance. This weapon seems to indicate that this version of the power fist that we see in Fallout 3 in New Vegas was first intended as a tool, rather than a weapon like the Fallout, Fallout 2 and Tactics version, merely being repurposed as a weapon after the war. While the Industrial Fist is a player-only weapon, Veronica's Power Fist is an NPC-only fist that is not used by the player. When equipped, it is a simple black box on the player and appears to do about the same damage as the base Power Fist. Fallout 4 has its own take on the Power Fist once again, giving us a whole new design. This design is very obviously industrial in nature, as it even has the yellow paint. The new design also looks heavier than ever and cannot be used while in power armor because it is meant to go over most of the forearm and hand, which would interfere with the power armor chassis. Even if the plates themselves were removed, it is stated in game that this weapon did not start life as a weapon, rather as a tool for demolition crews and similar lines of work, but were quickly adapted in the post-war to make sure you, and only you, got that last fancy lad snack cake. Each punch shows steam or high pressure gas venting, and sparks can be seen as well, indicating that it is pneumatically actuated and works with some sort of internal energy source that is never seen or changed out. Dealing 20 damage, it is only beat out by the Deathclaw Gauntlet, although it costs a little less AP per hit. It can take the Puncturing Mod, which is just a piece of concrete with jagged broken pieces of rebar sticking out, and it is chained to the ram that slams forward upon a punch. It does more damage and has armor penetration capabilities as well. The Heating Coil upgrade attaches a heating element to the ram that deals additional energy damage to targets. The concept art shows some cool ideas which include a much greater potential range, a circular saw blade attachment which we do not see on some melee weapons, and even some sort of self-propelled object that looks like it could be shot off and explode. Fallout 76 has the Power Fist in the same form, dealing a similar amount of damage and having the same upgrades as well. There is a unique variant known as the Face Breaker, which is given a slightly altered look with a cool skull on the upper part. Although it has the same base stats as the vanilla Power Fist, it also has three legendary effects, Furious, Power Attack, and Increasing Strength by One. This makes it a very formidable weapon for melee or unarmed builds, and is given to the player at the end of the quest, A Knight's Penance, which was introduced in the Steel Rain add-on. Looking at all the different variants, it seems like there was no concerted effort to make a weapon that could enhance the punching powers of individuals. Rather, they mostly seem to be industrial tools that were put to a whole different line of work in the post-apocalypse. The Power Fist and Mega Power Fist from the first three games seem to be the exception, and maybe the lack of a Power Fist that is similar to the early games could indicate an east-west divide that fans have long used to make sense of why certain weapons can be found in some games and not in others. The Impact Gloves from Fallout Tactics is interesting because it ends up being closer in form and function to the Power Fist in Fallout 3, New Vegas 4 and 76, rather than the traditional Power Fist look and function. The so-called gloves appear to be a contraption that goes around the wrist, hand, and forearm, and fires forward a spiked ram with the aid of two pistons. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? The glove part is just a regular glove which would indicate that these are post-war inventions rather than a mass-produced commercial product, or a weapon, and in tactics at least, it does a pretty low amount of damage. Base damage tops out at 8, which is a third of the max damage of a power fist. Maybe we can chalk this up to an inadequate design as a result of being produced in the post-war era, as opposed to the power fists from Fallout 3 and 4 which are obviously well-made pre-war devices, even though they all function on the same principle. There is also no ammo or energy replenishment for the impact gloves, so it looks like Tactics was the hipster of infinite energy weapons before Bethesda thought it was cool. The impact gloves are often found on Reaver patrols and really not any other group, perhaps alluding to the fact that the Reavers were the designers of this weapon. Originally starting life as a standalone weapon in the atomic shop in Fallout 76, the Bear Arm 
is a very intimidating weapon. It is in fact not a bear arm, nor is it alluding to the Second Amendment. It is the skull of a bear, or likely a Yao Guai if there even is a distinction anymore, that has been reinforced with metal and modified to be held so that the user's hand goes into the skull from where the neck would usually attach, and grips a metal bar so that it can be used to bash enemies face first with the jaws open. It does a respectable amount of damage and is a potential reward for completing the Project Paradise event at Atco's Pharma, after which there is a chance of the weapon dropping at other times in the game with legendary effects. I like the unique design of this weapon, but I really have to question the effectiveness. The teeth are obviously the part that does the most damage to the target, but this wouldn't be as effective as it seems in game. Unless Yao Guai have very different biology, the skull and teeth would not take too much punishment before they started to crack and break, because once teeth and bone are all dried up and dead, they become really brittle. We had a few bear skulls in the house growing up, and those teeth just start falling out of the skull all by themselves after not too long, and I wasn't really beating my brothers with them all that much. Everyone's favorite Fallout entry, Fallout Brotherhood of Steel gives us the so-called Iron Gloves, which looks like a large glove with some additions to the top of the hand and wrist area that I can't tell if it's simply styling or meant to be something functional. At any rate, they are just gloves, and possibly weighted gloves judging by the name, and it does a bit more damage than just bare knuckle fighting. It maxes at 10 damage, which isn't great, but the special attack skill can let the player charge up an attack for more damage. It is readily encountered in the beginning of the game and will be quickly dropped for other weapons because it is the second weakest weapon in the whole game, only being beaten out of the most dishonorable spot by the Shiv. I know picking on Brotherhood of Steel is picking the low hanging fruit, but I take particular issue with the item description where the latter half says, you should look for better gloves that offer groovy deadly attachments. Groovy? This game has a serious identity crisis since it is supposed to be part of a 50s retro sci-fi world, but then they have 2000s product placement and a new metal soundtrack. If enough of you are interested in watching me engage in destructive behavior, I would consider doing a let's play of this game in the future since this is the only Fallout game I have not yet played. New Vegas strikes again with a weapon that seems like it works a lot better in theory than in real life. The dog tag fist is rather simple, just having a number of dog tags that are placed between the fingers and wrapping the necklace chain around the hand to help secure them and keep them pointed perpendicular to the fist. Operating similarly to brass or spiked knuckles, this weapon has a low strength requirement of 1 and does not require any unarmed skill to wield. It does a surprising amount of damage at 20 and has a higher attack speed than boxing gloves. It cannot be found or bought anywhere, and can only be crafted after completing the Help for Halford unmarked quest, where the courier is supposed to recover 20 tags and the schematics to build it. Why it needs 20 tags? I don't know, since the in-game model only uses 3 for each hand. It is possible they are doubling up the tags to make them a little bit stronger, but that would still only be 12 tags, so who knows what the remaining tags are used for. Although dog tags are pretty strong, being made of stainless steel, if you are punching enemies with hard armor, I don't see these tags surviving long before being bent, thereby reducing their effectiveness. On the flip side, when punching things with dog tags held like this, it would definitely start to hurt your own hand and probably injure it as well after even a moderate amount of use. Since the dog tags are associated with a quest, there is some odd behavior in game since quest items cannot be dropped from the inventory. This means that they can go with the player into the Dead Money DLC, where they can be crafted into a quick weapon. The tags are also weightless since they are essential for the quest, but the weapon itself weighs 3 pounds. Dog tags can also only be picked up and dropped from the inventory, and cannot be grabbed and moved in the overworld like many other items can. Lastly, every tag is the same, with the name of Sergeant James Marish being printed on every one. Just when you thought New Vegas was perfect, I had to go and spoil it with that. Fallout Tactics does not let up with its unarmed weapon selection, and this time someone had the brilliant idea to sew a bunch of razor blades onto the top of a glove and call it a day. Dealing up to 10 damage, which isn't all that useful unless in the early game, the concept art gives greater detail as to the design of this weapon. Using a thick rawhide glove and sewing single-edged razor blades into the top, this thing was termed the cheese grater in the concept art, which 
honestly sounds far worse and a lot scarier than the so-called Lacerator. I honestly wish they would have kept that name because cheese graters are underrated, and only the movie Tenet ever did the cheese grater justice. Let's run with this blade theme for a second and talk about New Vegas' bladed gauntlets. Attaching to the wrist and forearm, this is obviously a post-war weapon since it is jagged sharp lengths of metal bound to a frame that is secured on the user's arm. The blades are situated above the user's hand, which allows the wearer to have some use of that hand, as opposed to designs that have the hand enclosed in the weapon, like the bare arm of Fallout 4 or the power fist from Fallout 4. The weapon has a strength requirement of 5 and deals 25 base damage with a decently fast swing speed. What makes this weapon worth considering in the mid-game is a bonus critical chance and bonus critical damage. The VAT's special attacks include a stomp, uppercut, and cross where the cross will cause two and a half times more damage to limbs. This weapon is fairly common and can be found at many merchants who sell weapons, making it an easily obtainable item. Due to the appearance, I had always thought that this should be a craftable weapon, because the game does let you craft much more complicated and better looking weapons. The weapon degrades quite quickly, being able to strike only 295 times before breaking which can be very problematic unless the player has the jury rigging perk. The unique variant known as the Cram Opener, which is a fantastic name, is more powerful than the base version with no drawbacks. Doing more damage and more critical damage, it has 25% more durability, which is a great and much needed boost. This unique variant is obtained from Little Buster, the bounty hunter that is commonly seen at Camp McCarran. If you don't want to kill him to get the weapon, complete the three card bounty quest and wait a few in-game days. Little Buster will be found dead at Freeside's North Gate near the railroad tracks and the cram opener can be looted off his body. There is a possibility of getting two of this unique weapon if you pickpocket it off Little Buster while he is alive and then go and find his dead body where a second one will be on his corpse. The bladed gauntlet and cram opener used to bypass damage threshold but that ability was taken out with a patch which reduced the weapon's effectiveness. Fallout Tactics Mace Glove is very aptly named since it turns the end of your arm into a giant mace. There isn't a whole lot of imagination with this one since it is literally a metal sphere with studs that fits over your hand and attaches with a leather strap to your forearm. It does up to 10 base damage and somehow only has a strength requirement of 1 and doesn't require any more AP cost than a normal unarmed weapon. And funniest of all, it weighs 4 pounds. I'm pretty sure I've eaten a 4 pound burrito no problem, so how could a metal sphere only weigh 4 pounds? There are definitely some in-game shenanigans going on. After finishing the initial quest at the Brahmin Wood, it is available for sale and can otherwise be encountered on some enemies in the game, although this is generally in the early game due to its remarkably low damage output. Fallout 4 has shockingly few unarmed weapons, and even fewer of these weapons are unique to Fallout 4. The meat hook is such a weapon and really rides the line between a melee weapon and an unarmed weapon, but that line is blurry at best. Being introduced in Far Harbor, it is commonly found amongst trappers that have co-opted this butcher's tool to be a fairly effective weapon. Doing 20 base damage with a medium swing speed, there are certainly better unarmed weapons at your disposal, and the one upgrade that can be done, the extra hook upgrade, which will add 2 more hooks for a total of 3, will do 5 more damage and add the chance to disarm an opponent upon a strike. It seems rather problematic to use a meat hook as a weapon, as it seems like whatever you successfully hit with this meat hook would be hooked, and if you're holding onto this weapon, whatever it is you're fighting is going to be permanently an arm's length away at most. It is nothing too spectacular, but it looks pretty cool and downright menacing when wielded by a hostile trapper in the mists of the island. A legendary variant known as the Butcher's Hook is sold by the friendly super mutant Ericsson on the island and does the same amount of damage, just benefiting from the relentless perk which fills the AP meter on a critical strike. In Fallout 76 it is shown in much the same state as in Fallout 4, which is to say that it is fairly unremarkable with the same upgrades and effects. The Punch Dagger is unique in the series as it is meant to be gripped in the hand and the blade protrudes out from between the middle and ring finger, just like a real world push dagger. The blade is quite long and the longer the blade, the harder it is to use effectively in this configuration. And although it can be found in the first mission, it can deal a max base damage of 14, which is better than most other early game unarmed options. The light weight also makes it a very reasonable weapon to just keep in your inventory regardless of what build you are doing. Dead Money from Fallout New Vegas doesn't offer much to the player when they first enter the Sierra Madre Villa. 
but one thing that can be made and encountered pretty early on is the so-called bear trap fist. Doing 27 base damage, it suffers from a slower than average swing speed and also requires an unarmed skill of 50 or higher to be used effectively. Should that requirement be met though, the pretty good damage coupled with the bonus limb damage can make putting down ghost people permanently a pretty good option since they will always get back up unless they are completely or partially dismembered. It is a fairly simple weapon, being just a bear trap that is tied to the user's forearm, with the jaws of the trap retracted farther back than normal, exposing the pressure plate on the user's fist. As you can imagine, striking an enemy will cause the trap to spring and bring the jaws clamping onto the enemy, causing serious damage. The odd thing about this weapon though is that it retracts and resets after swinging, which really should not be possible without physically pulling back the jaws and resetting the pressure plate manually. I can't even propose a theoretical way for this to work considering all the weapon consists of is a slightly modified bear trap, and by that I mean some of the metal is bent so that it can be tied to the user's forearm using a rope. In order to retract the jaws and reset the trap as quickly as shown in game, it would need to be electronically or pneumatically reset, but there is absolutely nothing else besides the trap, some rope, and cloth to make it a bit more comfortable to use. Josh Sawyer, explain yourself. Before the comment highlights, I want to do something that will become a mainstay on this channel, and that is a Fallout Community Spotlight. We all build Adam's Kingdom in different ways, and I want this to be an opportunity for anyone doing anything related to the Fallout series. Whether it be creating mods, videos, artwork, or any other Fallout related endeavor. So to kick this off, Adam has commanded me to talk about a very active and passionate mod creator, our very own Pignisman, or Pignis, or just Pig. Still not sure which one he prefers, but he responds to all of them. Pig is heavily involved in the modding community where he has made and directed the creation of a number of high quality mods for the Fallout 4 PC crowd. Known on Nexus as the Fallout 4 Story Expansion Project, Pig and a bunch of talented people create mods to increase the weapon options of the base game, like the Tinkerer's Ray Gun mod, or story mods that add lore friendly quests like the All Americans. All the mods of this project are lore friendly, as that is a guiding principle of their work, and they are very high quality as well. A lot of love and effort are put into these mods. Pig also uploads videos explaining how to use the GEC, which is Bethesda's community creation software that lets anyone with sufficient interest to try their hand at creating mods. Pig walks through how to do several things within the GEC that help new users along in creating their own mods, so if there is any desire at all to get into the Fallout modding scene, this is a great way to start. Here is Pig's Discord community, Patreon page, and YouTube channel, all of which can be found in the video description. So. If you want to assist him on any project, or otherwise just want to show him support, you can check out all of these links. Thanks to Pig for all he does for the Fallout community, and in moderating the crap show that is my Discord server. Just kidding, I love you guys. If you are a Fallout creator of any kind, reach out to me, ideally through Discord. You can find the link in the video description, or you can send me an email to my contact email. Let's talk. Now we get to go over some of the comments of my previous video that was the first in a series on the artificial intelligences of Fallout. That's AIs, not owls, like some of you thought from the thumbnail. Dr. Chaos and a few others mentioned that the brain selection for Skynet seems similar to Frankenstein, and there is even greater evidence that the abnormal brain that can be selected is a direct reference to young Frankenstein, where Igor takes the abnormal brain instead of the genius brain, and I definitely think this is a callback to that. Several people speculated about whether robots in the Fallout series are capable of self-awareness, since it seems like many of them do have what we would call a personality or general awareness outside of just a program. I mentioned I would specifically not go over such examples in this video series, mainly because there is too much speculation involved. It has been very interesting reading the comments though, and I do think that a video dedicated to exploring the question of whether some robots have achieved sentience or whether certain robot types are indeed even capable of sentience, so you can expect a video like that in the future. Supermassive let me know I'm an idiot, the only way the internet knows how. In reference to my question about whether or not Eden manufactured the iBots in the Capital Wasteland or designed them himself, he brought up the point that the iBots in the Divide would seem to indicate that their origins are not solely from the East Coast. 
Although it is interesting to note that the fan favorite Edie did start life at Adams Air Force Base, which we encounter in Fallout 3. iBots can be found in Fallout and Fallout 2, although they look very different and seem to be an altogether different generation of iBot. Still, I think from what we see from the Lonesome Road add-on, that is enough to answer the question that, no, Eden did not design them. Sergeant Robo made a good point when referring to the so-called makers, who gave Skynet updated tasks and then promptly abandoned it in the Sierra Army Depot, many years after the Great War. Since Skynet was made using reverse-engineered alien tech, perhaps it considers the makers to be the Zayton aliens, whose technology it is a descendant from. This is a very interesting idea and begs the question, how much does Skynet actually know about extraterrestrials? Outside of merely knowing that they exist and the technology under the Skynet hood owes its existence to them. On the subject of Skynet, Zach Watson thinks I was too hasty to dismiss the idea that the Enclave were the ones that Skynet refers to as the makers, since it is possible that the Enclave could have made brief contact with the AI, as they were known to do, and changed its directives before losing connection either accidentally or on purpose. It is possible, for sure. However, I really do think that the Enclave would have made a greater effort to try and uncover the technological treasures a facility with an advanced AI held if they knew that it existed and had enough control to update the AI's primary directives. I mean, they keep experimenting on Death Claws even though it ends in disaster every single time. You just have to know they'd be interested in the technology and possibly resources stored at the Sierra Army Depot if they knew it existed and had enough information and system privileges to interact with Skynet and reprogram its purpose. Vasevolod Putalov disputes the claim that AI may have triggered the Great War as Ace reports people have speculated. Although it is true that we are not aware of any AI that was meant to control military forces or nuclear armaments, I don't think that is strictly necessary to provide a spark to start the Great War. AIs could have fomented greater and greater tensions by trying out different things. For instance, causing power outages, disrupting supplies, releasing things being researched, like for instance a deadly disease, or genetically altered creatures. If neither China nor the US were aware of the possibility of rogue AIs committing small acts of terror, then these events could be interpreted as undercover operations from the enemy trying to weaken them, which would ratchet up tensions even further. There are well-documented moments in the real world where early detection systems malfunctioned and almost caused the launch of nuclear ordnance. If these AI systems deliberately or accidentally sent certain signals, or possibly even interference signals, to these detection systems, then it is possible that they could be responsible for the nukes getting launched. I haven't looked into it enough to agree or disagree, but I do think it's possible even if these systems didn't have direct control over nuclear weapons. Lastly, I don't do this often, but this is a comment from my comment highlight of the Talon Company video, where Terrible Duelist asks whether it is possible the Enclave could fund Talon Company. I absolutely believe that they could fund Talon Company, as Eden has direct control of the entirety of Ravenrock, which includes a certain amount of manufacturing capabilities. He also controls all the robots, so there is a way for Eden to both communicate with the inhabitants of the wasteland and a way to make money. If Eden, for example, creates and sells weapons, or maybe even some technology that Wastelanders would otherwise just have to salvage, since they do not have the manufacturing capabilities that Ravenrock could theoretically have to make them. So, that is it for this comment highlight and therefore my video. Take care of yourselves. Praise Adam in all that you do, and I will see you in the next video.